I'd like to make a couple of clarifications as we begin. Everybody who stood up so far this morning and says, wow, the numbers are down as we look around. First of all, I am glad that you are here. Thank you for, we have visitors with us today, family. We have, I'm not going to call you a visitor because your daddy was a preacher here in the 60s and, and you were here. We've got some great things. And then if you just look around here, you're missing all of the people at home. I want to remind you that during the height of the COVID epidemic, on one Sunday, we set a record attendance. There was nobody here in the auditorium. We had 601 people watching on the internet. And this morning, I know little Nora. Hi, Nora. Nora in Port Wyneme, California. She's about this tall, and she faithfully watches every week. I think I've included a picture of Nora climbing up uh, on it. And, and uh, she also made a, a comment. Hi, hi, John, hi, John. And then she turned to her mommy and daddy and says, He's not talking back. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Also, uh, it's not just here in the United States that we have Sharon in, in California who's watching. Uh, Karam in uh, a little congregation in India, one of my students from Sunset, is watching. Uh, Jonah, who uh, is a Christian in Beijing, is watching. So I want you to feel this morning... That it's not an empty pew beside you, but that the Christians have gathered all around us. And if we trust the scriptures, the angels are watching what's going on. And our loved ones are watching what's going on. This, is, this has been a tough week. Uh, again, our, our hearts go out to Steve and, and Anissa. Their, their son Jeremy died this past week. And we said goodbye to him on Thursday. Last night I received word that a very, very dear friend of mine who was an elder in Tempe, Arizona, uh, passed away with a, a, a brain aneurysm. Uh, they were on vacation in Orlando, Florida, with all the family had rented a house, and then he died in the, in the hospital last night. Um, we say goodbye, and yet, as we just sung in that song, loved ones are watching and waiting. This is a celebration. We celebrate life with a capital L, capital I, capital F, capital E, because the life that we celebrate not only is in this world, but it transcends this world. We will be together for all eternity with the angels in glory. That's something to be excited about. And that's what I, I want to talk about. This morning we'll talk about Peter and his great confession. But I want to begin by asking, what is your foundation? What is it that you are? Now, some of us might answer, well, I'm a carpenter, I'm an engineer, I'm a farmer. I'm... But what if you lost your job or lost your ability to cut wood or lost your ability to farm? What happens to your foundation then? Well, I'm a mother. I'm a wife, but what happens when your children grow up and leave home and go out on their own? And suddenly the house becomes very empty, and being an empty nester is a real thing. Uh, I, I do a lot with veterans, and thank you for your service. I was in the Army, my father was, my, my children were. Uh, that's, that's important. And many of the veterans have spent 20 years, some even 30 years in the service of our country, and then they retire and they're completely lost because that was their foundation and the foundation is gone. So let me ask that question this morning. What is your foundation? Well, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm a philosopher. I'm a fisherman. All of those things won't make for a solid foundation. So let's talk about foundations this morning. Let's open up our Bibles. We've kind of gotten out of this habit. If you brought your Bible with you this morning, uh, go ahead and hold it up. That's great. And if you didn't bring your Bible, scoot over next to somebody who's holding up their Bible, and we're going to get into the Word of God. One of the goals that the elders have set for us in this coming year is to get back to the Bible. 
to get back to the Word of God. Now, I know some of you are holding up your, your smartphones and your iPads. That's great. We live in a wonderful, wonderful age, but we need to get back to the Word of God. Our lesson today comes from the book of Matthew. So uh, there are 66 books in the Bible. Roughly two-thirds of it is what we call the Old Testament, and then one-third is the New Testament. And our lesson today comes from the book of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. Open your Bibles to Matthew and find chapter 16. Chapter 16. We're going to read together Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, "Uh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You are Peter, Peter means rock, And on this rock, not Peter, but the big rock, his confession, that is the foundation. I'm going to suggest to you not only of the church, but of who we are individually. Losing a job, losing our health, losing our family, losing everything. This is the one foundation that will endure. Now, one of my my very favorite professors from from graduate school was Dr. Frank Pack. Many of you have heard of Dr. Pack. Taught at Pepperdine. I think he's taught at all of the Christian universities. But Dr. Pack repeatedly would say, the key to understanding the Bible is to ask good questions. So as we look at our text this morning, let's ask some good questions. The first one is, where is Caesarea Philippi? What? Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is at the foot of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is 9,000, I think, 230-some feet high. It's in Israel. And why is this important? Because when you read the Word of God, don't just see black and white. Don't just see words on paper. But use your sanctified imagination. Picture yourself there. And to help us, we we look at the geography. Caesarea Philippi was a real place. In northern Israel today, let's see, I think, oh, we gave it away. All right, well, the map didn't appear. If we were to go to northern Israel, to what used to be Galilee, we have Lake Galilee. Lake Galilee is about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide, Beautiful freshwater lake surrounded by by mountains on all sides, and it's fed by the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows from Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in Israel. It's a very important place in Israel today. You've heard of the Golan Heights. This is the Golan Heights. Mount Hermon is a, a, a giant mass of limestone, and as you know, limestone absorbs water, and so it's full of cracks and fissures, and and inside it's a great reservoir of water. And because it's so tall, believe it or not, they actually have skiing in Israel today. Now, the ski season is two to four weeks long. It's not a big ski season. And uh, in 1996, there there was no snow at all, but uh, we're coming up on the snow season, the So if you want to go skiing in Israel, this is a a good time of year to do it. But coming out of the side, down at the base of the mountain, there is a cliff. This cliff was the foundation of Caesarea Philippi. It's also called Banias. Pan was the Greek god of wild places, and so water was where he was worshipped. And as you look at this This cliff face, it's about 80 feet high. There is a natural cave in the left side of it. Do you see that? And flowing out of this cave at the foot of it is 
the beginning of the Jordan River. And the water there is crystal clear, refreshing. I've actually been swimming in, in this location. I, I don't, it's just a, a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And the cave itself is, is fascinating because uh, it, it drops and then there's the water down there. And the ancients took their longest ropes and tried to find the bottom of this cave, the bottom of this water supply. And they never succeeded in doing that. And, uh, uh, and Ned and I were talking uh, at, at breakfast earlier this week about how interesting it would be to, to take a scope and send it down to the bottom to find out what would be at the bottom of this water supply that feeds the Jordan River. But if we look at it from a, uh, boy, we're skipping a bunch of slides. Well, all right, I'll, I'll just let you use your sac sanctified imagination to picture this. Where that cave is, in the days of Jesus, they had a temple there to Pan. And there were niches along the walls of this cave where they, they had... Uh, images of Pan and the Roman gods. And this was a, play, a pagan place. This is not a Jewish site. This was a place where they came and they worshiped Pan, the god of fertility and the wilderness and wild things. But this cave, because they couldn't find the bottom of the cave, this cave was called the Gates of Hell, or some would say the Gates of Hades. Hades is the god of the underworld. And this will be important because you remember reading earlier, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, That's, this is where they're standing in front of the gates of hell. Now, they're there, and Jesus then begins to ask his apostles questions. So as we look at this location, can you see them? Jesus is there. And 12 apostles, and they've all gathered around. And then around them on the outside are a bunch of pagans. And Jesus is asking his apostles. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, why didn't Jesus just say, who do people say I am? Instead, he uses this kind of obscure reference. That title, the Son of Man, comes from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel uses it over 80 times. We talk about uh, the sons of the pioneers. Not that they're actually physically descended of the pioneers, but, but they have some things about them. Or the daughters of the American Revolution, right? They're things that they honor. The son of man, Jesus is emphasizing the fact that, yes, He's divine, but he is here among us. Now, this is an amazing thing. Sometimes, especially when life is hard, uh, when we're ill, when we lose our jobs, when, when we have tragedy in our life, we ask with tears on our eyes, Lord, do you understand? Job asked that question in the Old Testament. Horrible, horrible things happened to Job. And Job asked, Lord, do you understand? Jesus, the Son of Man, is the New Testament answer to that question. Jesus left heaven and all that heaven is to come here and be a Son of Man. Think about it. God himself became hungry and thirsty Jesus, in the flesh, as a human being, knew what it was to be so tired he couldn't even walk into town to find something to eat. He had to send his disciples. Jesus knew what it was like to be thirsty. He asked the woman at the well, may I have a drink? The Son of God needs a drink? The Son of God lost his friends, Lazarus dies? Jesus describes himself as the Son of Man for our benefit. He understands what we're going through. He identifies with us. So when Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The first answer that comes up is, um, can I let you in on a secret? The more I work with computers, 
the more I believe that demon possession is real. All right? And if the demons hadn't got into the PowerPoint presentation right now, you would see the answers. What were the answers? We read them just a minute ago. John the Baptist. Some people say that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life. Herod Antipas. Jesus called Herod Antipas the fox. Herod Antipas believed that John the Baptist, you remember Herod was the one who had the head of John cut off. And Herod was fascinated with John. And Herod believed that John's come back to life. And that's why he can perform all of these miracles. He believed that Jesus was John the Baptist. And probably a lot of other people did as well. And then some people said, well, Jesus was Elijah. Why would they say Elijah? Do you remember Elijah the prophet? When did Elijah die? That's a quick question. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't die, all right? He was caught up into heaven in a whirlwind. And so they say, well, Elijah has come back down again. And they expected Elijah when the Messiah came. Of course, Jesus explained that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But some people believe that Jesus was Elijah or maybe Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Uh, certainly, Jesus was more than a man because he could perform these miracles. But then Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? All right. And that's the important one. Jesus has been working with his disciples, working with his apostles, performing miracles, teaching them, sending them out on missions, and has them all involved. And he says, all right, who do you say that I am? John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? And by the way, that is the most important question that you can answer this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is? Peter. I love Peter. We've been talking about Peter all month. And Peter stands up and he's got the answer. He knows. He says, um, you are the Christ the son of the living God. He says three things in the answer. Did you notice it? Look at your Bible. You are the Christ. What does that mean? Now, if you're here for Bible class, you've got the answer. Christ means the anointed one, the chosen one. In Jewish society, they anoint three people. Prophets, priests, and kings. We talked about it in, in class again. You know, when Queen Elizabeth gets out her sword and she bops Paul McCartney on the head with it three times, he's no longer Paul McCartney. Now he is Sir Paul McCartney or Sir Lancelot or whoever it is. You knight someone with the sword. You anoint someone to make them a priest a prophet or a king or the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the chosen one. The Jews would call him the Messiah. Messiah is the Jewish term, Mashiach, for the anointed one, the chosen one. Christ, Christos, is the Greek term for the anointed one, the chosen one. And Peter has come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the promised one, the one who's going to come and rescue Israel. Now, the, the Jewish mythology says that this Christ, the Messiah, he's going to be a, a Jewish Alexander the Great, that he's going to come and he's going to throw out the Romans and conquer the Greeks, and the Jews are going to rule the world. That's why Jesus didn't come around and tell people, I'm the Messiah. Because when he used the term Messiah, they saw something different. They saw this conquering hero. And so Jesus has been working with the apostles to help them to understand that the true Messiah, the true Christ, the one that you and I believe in, isn't a conquering hero. He is the one who brings salvation, provides a foundation for us. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, Jesus said, who's the Son of Man? And Peter says, Son of God. And that 
is the whole point. Jesus was incarnated. That means in the flesh. Jesus left heaven and, well, you know the cross? When you picture the cross and Jesus hanging on the cross, he's suspended between heaven and earth because Jesus is holy God and holy human being. He is the bridge between heaven and earth. He is the son of man. He knows what we're going through. But he's also the son of God who is able to to change our life, to give us hope, to give us life. Life eternal. You are the Christ, the son of God. But he modifies that. We need to pick up those little words. That's why it's important to study the scriptures carefully. He is the son of the living God. They're standing there in front of a pagan temple, temple to Pan and and all the rest of the Greek and Roman pantheon. There are idols all around them. What are the idols? The idols are carved out of stone. I remember visiting a, a Buddhist temple in Korea, and I felt like I was in Disneyland. I mean, they had They had all of these idols that were carved there, fantastic figures and faces and dragons and things, and and they're all looking down, and they're all painted in garish technicolor. But they're kind of laughable. To Peter, these gods were dead. Little g, if you even want to insult the true Lord by using the same term, gods. You are the son of the living God. That means Jesus isn't far away. God is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is not on a coffee break waiting for the trumpet to sound to come back. The floor of heaven is clear as glass. Jesus is watching, and he knows each one of our struggles, and he speaks to the Father on our behalf because Jesus cares, and God the Father cares. Our God is a living God, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar simply means son of, and so Peter's full name is Simon, and he's the son of His father, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Do you believe this morning? And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They're looking at this big rock face. But the real rock, the foundation that we can build our lives on, is the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy, that he is the son of the living God who has come to be with us, the living God who cares about us. And so, I really hate PowerPoint. The confession. We know, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. How do we become a Christian? We hear the gospel, and we believe that it is true, and not just intellectual assent, but we believe it, we incorporate it in who we are. And if we believe that it's true, we believe that there is a true God, then we repent of our sins. We want to leave that past behind, and we confess. Now, we think of confession as, I'm sorry, I did it. But in the New Testament, confession is used two ways. One, yes, like when they came out to John the Baptist, they confessed their sins. They repented and confessed. But it is also a profession. The confession of faith is the rock. It is the foundation that we live our life on. And so as we leave the assembly today, we make the good confession. Paul talked about that to young Timothy. That we take hold of heaven with that confession.
It is a place from which we can stand and we can face all the struggles of life. We can lose everything and we still gain heaven because we believe, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's all stand together and sing this next hymn.